I'm sure all of you rushed out Friday to see the new Noah movie. Um, I'm kidding. I assume that most of you did not do that. I did not do that. And I have been on the fence for several months as to whether or not I would go see the movie. And I'm still on the fence, but I'm leaning pretty heavily toward not going to see it. Uh, but I'm, I'm thankful that... Uh, the truth of the Bible and the people who are recorded in the Bible are exposed to our culture. And I want people in our culture to know what happened in the days of Noah. And I want people in our country and in the world to know about the faith and the courage and the perseverance and the hard work and the obedience of Noah. I think it's a great thing for people to hear about Noah. But I saw a headline this week, I read an article this week, where the director and producer of the movie bragged that this was the least biblical movie ever made. And I read several reviews about the movie, and the movie talked about that the word God was never used in the movie, only the word creator, and that only once. And apparently, and so as you know, what I'm telling you is completely from things I've read. I have not seen it. But God does not speak clearly to Noah. He gives him visions of water and visions of animals and things of this nature. And Noah is very up in the air and unsure about what he is supposed to understand to be God's will. And so the communication from the creator to Noah in this movie is very unclear. Noah is also presented, and his family are presented as uh, profound vegetarians who never eat meat. Uh, this almost certainly violates the scriptural account because, as you know, the animals that they took into the ark, they took two of every animal, except for the clean animals, they took seven. But then after they came out of the ark, they sacrificed some of the sevens of the clean animals that they took in with them. They killed animals. And according to this movie, Noah was violently opposed to the killing of animals. And so I'm probably not going to see the movie. But I am going to teach about Noah. And I want us to think about Noah. Noah's truth, the record of Noah's experience is recorded beginning in Genesis 6. It goes through 7, 8, and 9 uh, of the book of Genesis. But instead of asking Andrew to read uh, four chapters from Genesis, uh, I ask him to read this one passage from Hebrews 11, where the New Testament talks about the faith of Noah. And that's what I want us to think about for a few minutes this morning. How does your faith compare to Noah's? How does your response to God's instructions compare to Noah's? Because most of you know, all of you will learn that a storm is coming. You're going to have storms in your life. You're going to have cataclysms and catastrophes in your life. But one of the things that I want you to see about Noah is that Noah was faithful before the storm. Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6, verses 8 and 9, records, Genesis, the beginning of Genesis 6, records the evil of man, how God decided to destroy mankind from the face of the earth. He's going to wipe everything out, wipe everybody out. But verse 9, verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The King James says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the records of, gener of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. What a powerful statement from the author 
of the creation. Noah walked with God. Another man who was said to walk with God was Enoch. And he was no more, for God took him. Enoch was removed from the world because he walked with God. Noah also walked with God, but he had to walk through the destruction of the world. But Noah was faithful long before the flood. Even before God's decision to destroy the earth with a flood, Noah was faithful. Even before God told Noah, Noah, there's a flood coming, Noah was faithful. We need faith in our everyday life. If you think that your faith is going to grow strong and see you through that storm, but you won't need it until you get to the storm, you're wrong. If you don't have faith when the days are bright, you will not have faith when the days are dark. You will be alone, and you will be washed away by the anguish and the fear and the torment and the worry that comes with the catastrophe. Noah wasn't, because Noah had faith before the storm. Romans 1.17 says, the righteous man shall live by faith. King James says, the just shall live by faith. Noah was a righteous man. Noah lived by faith. Roman goes on to teach us a lot about faith. One of the things that it teaches us is that everything we should do, everything we do should be in conformity with our faith. Romans 14, 23, talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols and talking about conscience and if it bothers your conscience. says that he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. You see what Paul is saying to us there in Romans 14. He's saying even the food you choose should be controlled by your faith. The most basic elements of your everyday life should be controlled by your faith. Not just when things are really, really scary. Not just when you're really, really worried. Every day, three meals a day, all the time, faith. Romans also tells us in Romans 10, 17, where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Noah's faith was not based on vague visions. Noah's faith was not based on difficult to interpret dreams. You go back to Genesis 6, God said, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. And if you want to save it, if you want to live through it, you're going to have to build an ark. And you're going to build it after gopher wood. And you're going to build it exactly this long. And you're going to build it exactly this wide. And you're going to build it exactly this high. And you're going to bring these exact number of animals into it. You're going to coat it inside and out with pitch, which is like tar. This was not vague instructions. And how do we know Noah had faith? He followed the instructions. His faith came from hearing, and his hearing from the Word of God. Notice also that Noah believed what seemed impossible. It's a big part of faith. Faith is based on evidence. Faith is based on proof. God has proven himself to us just like he proved himself to Noah. And one of the ways that he proves himself to us is by giving us the account of Noah. But when you see the proof and you realize that God exists, part of that realization is that God is greater than natural law. God created natural law. And so as followers of Jesus, as people of God, we are not trying to be the smartest. We are trying
trying to believe. We are trying to be the believings. We're not trying to be the most subtle thinkers. We're trying to be the most childlike believers. Because God makes it true. When he says he will do it, he will do it. And when he told Noah, I will do it, Noah believed it. He had faith because God said it. And it may be that it was even more difficult for Noah to believe than it is for us. One of the ways that a lot of people who scoff at the Bible and who criticize the Bible say the Bible can't be trusted is they'll bring up Noah. Oh, you think there was a universal flood? Yes, I do. Absolutely, 100%. I believe that every mountain on earth was covered in water. Because the Bible says it. And God can make it true. But it's speculated. The Bible doesn't say this. But it's speculated that Noah had never seen rain. It's speculated that Noah had never seen even a small flood. Even the kind of flood where water gets up into somebody's house because it's raining so far. He never even seen that. Now, I don't know. Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse 6 says that a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. But that's before, that's in day 2. That's before all of the animals and a lot of the vegetation on the earth has been created and planted. And so it's not absolutely clear that that mist continues all the way until the day of Noah. Because if the earth had no rain but was only watered that way, that would mean that the way our atmosphere works was drastically different than the way it is now. When the seas and the moon and the ocean changes and the movement of air across the world, that, that's a radical difference. And so we have to be very careful saying there was definitely no rain until Noah, until the flood. But it's possible, and there is some biblical reason for saying that that's true. And if it's true that Noah had never even seen rain, imagine the faith that that required. He believed it because God said it. I've never seen a universal flood. I've never seen Mount Everest underwater. But I believe it because God said it. That's what faith requires. Once you evaluate the evidence and you realize that God is trustworthy, then you've got to believe what he said. But let me tell you, if there was a universal flood, even if you couldn't imagine it before the flood, there would be evidence of it later. It was miraculous in its cause, but it wouldn't be without long-lasting effects. Did you know that every, almost every culture in the world, from South American natives to Australian natives to Eskimos to people who live in the, in the far regions of the north to people in Asia to people in Europe, almost every culture has myths or legends about a universal culture. There has been passed down through the history of every tribe, a story of God destroying the earth with a flood. If you look at geology, you look at the ground, you look at the rocks, you look at all the things that they tell us prove the earth is millions and millions and millions of years old. You know what you find? You find evidence of rapid burial plants and animals. They tell us that these layers of rocks that are different colors and look different have to be laid down over hundreds of thousands of years. But what they don't tell you in these movies like they're putting out now is that through these same layers of rocks that are different, sometimes you'll have a fossilized tree that goes through multiple layers of rocks. And sometimes you'll have a tree turned upside down going through multi layers of rock. And sometimes you'll have a tree sideways. Like all these trees were just suddenly covered and buried and blown apart. Animals 
the same way. They have fossils of elephants buried hundreds at a time. Like there was a huge cataclysm. And not just one, but spread out over thousands of miles. That's what the evidence actually says. And the reason they discarded the theory of the global flood to explain these geological formations, well, that requires you to believe in miracles. And we can't believe in miracles. Well, if you presuppose, if you go in assuming that miracles are impossible, then certainly you're going to conclude that there was no universal flood. But if you open your mind to the possibility that there is a creator with miraculous power, a universal flood is almost inescapable. <clears throat> Noah believed the impossible. And he was right to do so. <clears throat> Noah preached. But nobody responded. Genesis, I mean, 2 Peter 2, verse 5, calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Noah is a preacher of righteousness. 1 Peter 3, verse 20, <coughs> talking about the ark, says, wherein eight souls were brought safely through the water. Eight people, eight human beings were on the ark. Genesis 6, when they first start recounting the events of Noah's life, says Noah was 500 years old. When Noah went onto the ark, he was 600 years old. Genesis records this very specifically. When Noah came off the ark, he was 601 years old. So from 500 to 601, or to 600 when he went on the ark, 100 years. 2 Peter 2 tells us he was a preacher of righteousness. There's a lot of ways to interpret that. It may mean that he just preaches for us today through the pages of Scripture. But more than likely, he explained to people why he was building an ark. More than likely, Genesis says, long before the ark was begun, Noah was upright and blameless because he was telling people the will of God and telling people about the sinfulness in their lives. And so the better conclusion is that for at least, probably longer, but at least a hundred years, no preach. Only are eight people. Noah his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. That's it. When our attendance here goes down by ten people, I get frustrated. I get upset. I get hurt. Oh, it, it, it discourages me. It makes me feel bad. I can't imagine preaching for a hundred years. How many eight people show up? It's all. But he did. Sometimes we pray for six months and we say, Well, God's not even listening. <laughs> Maybe you've prayed for a loved one, but they'll repent. Maybe you've prayed for somebody that you genuinely love and you're genuinely worried about their soul. Pray for them for 20 years. Multiply that by five. Then multiply it by the whole world. And you got nothing. It's estimated, I only heard this recently, that there were probably more people on the earth during the days of Noah because of longevity than there are today. Seven billion people on earth today possible that more people died in the flood than are alive today. That's the destruction that Noah saw. It's the destruction that he almost certainly begged people to avoid. Finally, Noah had faith in the warnings and the threats of God. 
It's easy to have faith in the promises of God. Titus 1 verse 2 says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Man, I love that promise. God, who cannot lie, promised eternal life. Praise God. I am so thankful for that. I love believing in that promise. It's easy to believe in that promise. It's easy for me to think, yeah, heaven, that's my goal, that's where I want to go. It's easy to preach on the commandments. And it's not too hard to believe in the commandments. Thou shalt not murder? Yes, sir. Thou shalt not steal? Absolutely. Big fan of that. I, I absolutely believe in the commandments. Psalm 119, 66, teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. But what about the warnings? What about the warnings? Let me tell you something very clear. You cannot believe in the promises of God and disbelieve the warnings of God. You cannot believe that God is going to save those who repent without believing that God is going to punish those who rebel. You cannot believe that God is going to save those who believe and also believe that God is not going to punish those who turn away. Some people try. Some people believe in heaven, they believe in salvation, they believe in redemption. I just don't know about it. I, I'm just, I just can't see. I, I just don't think God would do. I just, I mean, I'm just not a loving God. It's not compassion. That's not who I think God is. What do they really believe? They really believe in what they think. They really believe in what they can figure out for themselves and what makes sense in their minds and in their hearts. They believe themselves, not the word of God. You don't believe in God. And you don't believe in the word of God if you don't believe the threats. Noah believed the threats. That's why he built God. That's why he did what God said. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and permitted them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by the all his deeds. Notice verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise the Lord. Turn to the next chapter. Chapter 3, verse 2 Peter. Verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. People use the same argument today. Oh, Y'all been preaching the destruction of God for 2,000 years. This still hasn't had. Nothing's ever changed. Exactly what he's talking about here. Verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Noah received a warning. He says, I'm going to destroy the earth by water. Noah believed it. And he stands as a symbol of faith for us today. But we too have been given a warning. 
And the warning is that God will destroy the earth with fire. That he will melt the elements with intense heat. And he will destroy the ungodly. He will destroy those who turn away and follow their own selfish desires. That's the warning. And as true as it was for Noah, it's true for us today. As the world was destroyed in the days of Noah, it will be destroyed again. And those who were righteous and faithful to God in Noah's day were saved. And those who are righteous and faithful today will be saved. And those who were not faithful to God were destroyed. And those who will not be faithful to God today will be destroyed. And if you believe God, you must believe that. And it should motivate you to do what God said. It starts with faith. I believe what God said. And because I believe what God said, I'm going to do what he said to do. Just like that. How big your house is didn't matter when the flood came. How many sheep you had didn't matter when the flood came. And how many people liked you didn't matter when the flood came. The only thing that mattered was were you in the ark or were you outside? And the same is true today. Are you in the church or are you outside? Because it's the church that Jesus is coming back for. It's his body of believers he's coming back to save. It's those people who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the rest will be banished to outer darkness. How does your faith compare to this? God is patient. That same passage in 2 Peter 2 says that God does not want anybody to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He's patiently waiting for you to change. If you're ready to stop, if you're ready to give in and say, okay, God, I want to do it your way. Now's the time. If you need to come to Christ to receive the forgiveness of sins that's available in the body of Christ, come today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.